So this week we're going to discuss uh, apologetics with atheists and agnostics. How many of us have, uh, have routinely uh, defined ourselves defending the faith or speaking about the faith with atheists or agnostics? <laughs> uh -huh. Occasionally. I'd say my own, my own family. Yeah, Which my own family. Fine. Yeah. And for me, it's very frequent, uh, not with my family. Although I, I think my stepson at this point is an agnostic, although we really don't discuss the faith, but, but uh, it regularly happened at work. So most, um, many Christians are sort of appalled at the fact that atheists and agnostics can exist at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's fairly easy to, to be an atheist or an, or an agnostic. Uh, particularly atheists tend to come from uh, really two groups, families with a long history of atheism. That's often true of people, of families that particularly have uh, a long history of political activity. They tend to pass on their atheism to uh, their descendants along with their political views. And it's also very common among people who have been, uh, feel themselves to have been badly hurt by Christianity. And, and there are large numbers of those, and especially in my experience, large numbers of them among um, evangelical fundamentalists. Uh, so what I wanna to do tonight is, is we'll begin, I wanna begin by talking about the kinds of atheism, what atheism is, what kinds of atheists we likely to encounter uh, we talk a little bit about agnosticism, some sort of principles for how to go about doing apologetics. And then I want to spend the remainder of the, the uh, class focusing on the first question about uh, the um, inadequacy of the Bible to understand contemporary reality and uh, uh, the religion's rejection of science. I think that that's the most common practical objection that atheists and agnostics have to to uh, Christianity, and it's the one that I've most, at least it's also the one that I've most often encountered. So, atheism is simply a belief that God does not exist. It comes from the Greek uh, Greek phrase "ah." which means no, uh, it's a negation, and theos, which means no God. So there are really at this point, uh, among atheists who are, you know, sort of uh, well-grounded in their atheism, uh, is, uh, instead of simply kind of incidental atheists, there are, you can sort of distinguish three kinds of atheism, and then there's a fourth large category of atheists who don't acknowledge that they're atheists, but really are. So the first two categories are uh, humanistic atheists and egocentric atheists. These are my terms. And you know, if you look on the web for types of atheism, you'll find atheism you know, broken down in different ways differently than this. But I think that this is a fairly accurate representation. So the first two groups, the humanistic and egocentric atheists, are like Christians in the sense that they live out their philosophy of God's non-existence in the same way that Christians do or should live out their faith uh, and their belief in God's existence. So what are humanistic atheists? Uh, they, they tend to be followers of philosophers such as Bertrand Russell or Karl Marx or writers such as Sigmund Freud, who was an atheist. 
in some cases, did, did everyone read the 119th Psalm? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so in some cases, mm. the, the point of origin or the point of departure for their atheism is the Bible itself. So did every anyone see how the 119th Psalm can be used to support atheism? And can anyone guess who did it? Who used it in that way? 115th Psalm. Yes, thank you. 115. Yeah, yeah, I, I read both. Since. Yeah, because yeah, ah, that would, oh, thank God. Had 119, then had 115th in the email. Okay, then it was the 115th. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah it's oh, 115th. Yeah. Okay, can, I, I had problems understanding that one out. And I didn't think that was going to be the most difficult. You had, you had problems with, what? It was figuring it, figuring out the psalm just you know, that justified the existence of God. I read it many times, but for me, it was hard to find in the 115th a place that I could definitively point to. And may, and it's probably because I don't have the theological background that I need. I you know I just don't have okay. it. Okay. Well, let's let's read it then. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to Your name, give glory for the sake of your mercy and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in the throat. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So it goes on with praise, but, but that first part of the psalm is the important part. So the question is, it begins with, where is their God? So pagans are asking the question, where is their God? Because Yahweh is not visible. Yahweh has no visible presence. And they wow. have visible gods. They have idols. And, uh, you know, well, they have idols which they've made, which are depictions of their gods and then become, come to be worshipped as their gods. What so, I got out of okay. But go, I'm sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. What I got out of it was um, all of their gods are within the materials on Earth, and um, they attribute um, their gods to. I mean, it's a it's a way of materialism that they they have to have they have to show in a, a physical um, hands on thing. Uh huh. That, is their God. Right. They're statues, they're not living. Right. And right. isn't there somewhere else in the Bible where it talks about that actually, uh, was it a prophet that actually um, challenged people? They were actually feeding their idols from down below. So pretending that their idols were eating the food. Mm -hmm. And it was in contrast to the Eucharist or live, you know, uh -huh. um, sacrifices. Maybe it's something in the Magnificat the last couple of weeks. I don't remember. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're statues. They're not real. But you know, right. like Mary Lou said, so it's a representation of something that isn't really alive. Uh huh. Not alive. So then that last line: those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. So the important point there is that you become like your God. Mm. So, so the the uh, the idol is is a non-existent God. Yeah, it's the work of human hands. And so the tragedy of idolatry of worship of idols is that the idol 
takes control over you. It's inanimate, it's powerless, it's lifeless, and yet you give control to it. So it has control. You become like the thing you worship. So now you just have to stand that on the head, its head and remove idol from it and substitute Yahweh or God who is invisible. Even more so, God is invisible. So you build an imaginary God, impute power to him. And that thing, that figment of your imagination assumes power over you. So that, so can anyone guess whose argument that is? Who's what it is? Who, 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 whose atheism is based on the argument I just oh, presented. Oh, the argument. <laughs> Signing out. I'll give you a hint. He was a Jew. Egocentric. What, Connie? Egocentric. Is that the second one? No, no, no. A humanist atheist. Oh. It, it was. It was Marx. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's the basis of Karl Marx's critique of religion. Um, mm. Marx was. Um, Marx quoted the Bible extensively in his writings, including the New Testament. Uh, sort of the interesting thing is that Lenin, uh, the leader of the Russian Revolution, also quoted St. Paul frequently. So, so um, Human mystic atheism usually has also has a distinct historical and philosophical dimension. Um, the uh, the secondary to a focus on evil and injustice in the world, particularly evil and injustice uh, injustice perpetuated by religious people and religious institutions. So there tends to be a real focus on sort of the notion that God is, God is on our side. Um, there's usually a recognition and even an admiration of some religious figures. You know, so for example, Martin Luther King or Christ himself um, but there's a that they're far and away the exception rather than the rule. Um, and, and there's sort of a human tendency to focus on the bad examples rather than the good examples. Um, so, for example, for me, my father was a very godly man, and, and our family comes from a Catholic family with a long history of service to God. But my example of a Catholic was my sister, who was uh, fell a little bit short, shall we say. Um, there's also a social focus on the disparity between what should be and what is, with a general belief that religion is responsible for a large part of that disparity that religion is an institution that fosters uh, human oppression and human degradation. So the, uh, sort of the classic statement of atheism comes from um, a Russian anarchist named Michael Bakunin, who said that if God didn't exist, he would have to be created. Uh, because he's a, a perfect figure to reinforce the oppression of social institutions. <laughs> so the second type of atheists are egocentric atheists. They tend to be, they tend to be followers of philosophers such as 
Friedrich Nietzsche or, Ayn, or writers like Ayn Rand. Uh, yeah. They reject religion as an infringement on individual liberty and infringement on personal autonomy and uh, on the, an infringement of the individual's quest and right to be great. So they, they see religion as, a, as, as uh, an institution that limits individual freedom. Yeah, and unfortunately they feel the world revolves around them. <laughs> yes, exactly. So ironically, which group are, do Christians tend to have the best relationship with? The humanistic? No. No? No. Wow. It, it's shocking, actually, because there's a real basis for connection in you know, Catholic social teaching with humanistic re, uh, atheists. And in fact, in, in South America particularly, there was a close connection uh, between humanistic atheists and the Catholic Church. Okay, that's but, where I get it framed from. Yeah, but in the United States, the close relationship is between egocentric atheists and, and, uh, and uh, especially evangelical Christianity. So for example, the Tea Party, which was founded by Christians, right, is a fundamentally uh, egocentric atheistic movement. It's, its inspiration is Ayn Rand and Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, its real focus is on me and my individual rights, which should not be curtailed by, you know, anything else. Like wearing a mask. Like wearing, we're right, like wearing yeah, a mask. Yeah. And so we yeah. see the infusion of, of, uh, of egocentric atheism into, you know, those evangelical churches that see coronavirus as a hoax or as an attempt to curtail religion or as an infringement on the right to worship when in fact, you know, we're called to be a people of sacrifice, mm -hmm. not a people who look out for number one. And, and here these are people who look out for number one. Um, so the, the, there's a, a new atheism that's been particularly propounded by scientists and is recommended, uh, it's reflected in the, the uh, Bishop Barron's video uh, and is represented by people like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris and Stephen Hawking. Um, so it's sort of atheism with the scientific veneer that science provides, you know, the truth. Um, so the interesting thing about it is that its social focus is drawn from humanistic atheism. So some of the critique of religion is, is you know, worth serious attention. But, but it's, as Bishop Barron points out, it's lacking in a philosophical or a theological underpinning. And so the uh, reasons for disproving God then after you, you know, do the thing with science and whatever, goes back to egocentric atheism. So it's a, a very bizarre mix. And it ignores the fact that science is not value neutral. You know, simply science itself is not going to bring about improvement in humankind. Science has brought us nuclear weapons you know, a major focus of science is improving the means of death. And, you know, that's always going to be the case. Uh, uh, science has to be, have a, some sort of moral authority, a moral structure, and a broader philo philosophical structure imposed on it. And then, although th th this, you, you can't conduct apologetics with this, the fourth group of atheists, the fourth group of atheists are practical atheists. They're, they're drawn from uh, religious groups, religious faiths of all kinds. 
And uh, so they pre profess a belief in God, but they don't actually believe in God. They're, uh, they're basically, their religiosity, their faith is based on a decision to serve themselves and to, to oppress others. So practical atheism, practical atheism crafts its gods according to one's own desires, and then typically uses God's name as a justification for that. Okay, I have a, this is kind of a weird practical question, but I, when I was first married and I'd only been a Catholic uh, two years, I ran into, I, I made a good friend in teaching because I taught, and um, I said, everybody's, no, I said, gee, everyone in Texas is, because that's where I was living, is so religious, and she sort of chuckled, she was really sweet, and she said, no, we're just churchy, and uh -huh. so I don't know how that fits in there, but it seems like a lot of times the people that were, I guess, churchy did seem like really God wasn't that important. Uh-huh, churchy is a good, is a good, uh description yeah their lives so, revolved around the church but they didn't really you know act godlike right so the um the um sort of basis of practical atheism comes from uh, the new testament and particularly from chapter 16 of saint matthew's gospel if if you remember um uh, matthew uh, rather Jesus, or rather the Pharisees, ask Jesus for a sign. And Jesus says that no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Actually, why don't we take a quick look at St. Matthew's Gospel. It's chapter 16. Verse 1, starting at verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they discussed it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, saying, O oh, men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000? And how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to perceive that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they're seeking for a sign. And Jesus calls them a, a, a rude and adulterous, an evil and adulterous generation. And no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's a sign really after the fact. So as a sign, it's useless. But a clue to what Jesus means comes from the fact that he's calling them an evil and adulterous generation. So they're asking him to prove that he's the Messiah. The Messiah is to come in conjunction with the day of the Lord. What is the major sign of the day of the Lord? The, the Old Testament talks about the sun standing still and whatever, but those are all symbols. That's all imagery. Those aren't really real signs. The major sign 
is that it's a period of idolatry. And Jesus is saying that these are the idolaters. They're the sign. And why are they the sign? We see it in the second part. They don't see God as active. You have to do it yourself. God helps he who helps himself, right? So God is inert. God is inactive. You've got to do it. So that's one form of, of, uh, of practical atheism. And we see it reflected in the, uh, prosperity theology. You know, God wants to bless you. That's the point of the divinity. Or you, know, you have to have a positive attitude about yourself. So, you know, you get this positive attitude, you go out becoming prosperous, and, you know, presumably God is blessing you, but in fact, it's you doing it. And then the second form of practical atheism is, you know, uh, an adherence to ritual. You know, so the Pharisees were very good at following the precepts of the Mosaic law as they interpreted them and as it, 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 suited them uh, as it worked for them. So we see that very frequently, especially in the liturgical religions and in Catholicism, as long as you kind of do the right stuff. You know, if you go to mass each week, you'll be okay. If you take the, the Eucharist each week, you know, you're fine. Uh, as long as the mass is observed properly according to what you perceive to be the correct ritual, and then there, there's disagreement with about you know before Vatican II and after Vatican II, then it's good. But that belief that the ritual itself is is uh, has some value apart from the profound meaning behind the ritual reduces the ritual to magic, and that is contrary to the church's teaching. So that's practical atheism, and it's actually, I think, the most, uh, most uh, common form of atheism, and it's found among religious people who openly profess a belief in God, but, you know, don't really believe it. So that's atheism. Agnosticism is simply an uncertainty about the existence of God. It comes from the uh, Greek word a, which again is a negation, and gnosis, which means knowledge. So it's a lack of knowledge about uh, the existence of God. Agnosticism is large. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons for being an agnostic, um, but well, what's sort of interesting about agnosticism is that, for the viewpoint, from the viewpoint of Christians, agnostics are are simply um, agnosticism is sort of simply a form of atheism by default. Uh, you know that that sort of tends to take on a refined and gentlemanly veneer. So agnostics are really, you know, sort of really atheists, but don't want to be as forceful as atheists are. From the viewpoint of atheists, agnostics are really, uh, agnosticism is really a form of religiosity by default, by those who really don't have the courage of their convictions. So they don't want to openly take a stand about being Christian or you know, members of some other religion, but they really are. They're just more cowardly than most. Um, so are there any questions about that? Thoughts or comments? We've, we've covered a lot of ground very quickly. One of, the, one of the questions that I have, Ron, is when, um, when in speaking to people criticizing Catholicism is they're saying that, that you've been brainwashed. Uh -huh. Catholics have been brainwashed. And what is a good um, way of refuting that? 
Well, you, you, you try to engage in a discussion to see what they mean by that. What, well, how have Catholics been brainwashed? The, the most common, I mean, I, I think that in terms of brainwashing, the most common form of that critique comes from uh, evangelical Christians or other Christian denominations. I think that atheists tend not to see brainwashing at work as, as much as they see simple stupidity at work uh, or, <laughs> or viciousness. Oh, uh, one thing, oh, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, go ahead, Terry. No, th if you're still talking on, on that, go ahead. I was just gonna bring up a, a, a comment. Oh, okay. So yeah, the important thing is to, I mean, what you always wanna try to do if you're you know, going to engage somebody is to try to move from the, the generalities to the specifics. So, you know, how am I brainwashed? There's no way, there's no way to refute the, you know, the charge that I'm brainwashed other than, you know, well, I'm not brainwashed, you're brainwashed. And then, <laughs> no, you're really brainwashed. Ah, no, you're, you're brainwashed and you're stupid. I mean, that, that can't possibly go anywhere because you know, it's a too high a level of abstraction. It's meaningless. Uh, even if it's true, it's meaningless. So you always wanna to try to dig into the details. Well, it, it, comes, it comes from people that have been practicing Catholics and then because of uh, things that have happened in the church and stuff that ha I, um, are leaning, they're, they're looking for some reason why they're looking for some reason why they are falling, falling, and well, falling away. Uh -huh. right. They're looking for some reason for it, and and they're coming back. Well, I went to so many years of Catholic education, and that all of that was brainwashing. Uh -huh. What do you mean by brainwashing? Well, your sins are forgiven if you go to confession. That's a bunch of hooey, you know. And and they're they're getting down to some of the basics that we truly believe in. When they and they say, "Well, you've just been brainwashed into thinking that way." So, usually, um, and so, for example, the, the 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 attack on confession typically doesn't come from atheists who, you know, okay. don't care about that stuff. Yeah. All right. So the way to to refute is to refute it is to have a, a solid understanding of why the church uh, believes, teaches the sacrament of reconciliation, okay. which focuses on the authority given to, to the, um, to, by Jesus to his disciples to forgive and not forgive sin. Mm -hmm. and, and also focuses on the fact that as human beings, we have a tendency towards self-deception so on the one hand, it's true that God himself forgives sin. But on the other hand, it's also very easy for us to you know, say, God, I did this, I repent, I'm sorry, when we don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, confession before a priest becomes very important as a means of uh, you know, preserving uh, uh, of protecting us from our ourselves and our own self deceptions, okay. and bringing out our it forces us to bring out our humility, right? And see ourselves truly and not hide it, right? Uh huh. And it forces us to engage our sins, which you know is also another thing that nobody really likes to do. That's why it's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't mean to just bring up the confessional thing, but it, it um, that's one of the the um, arguments that I have with with one of my kids all the time. Is I just I went to sixteen years Catholic school. I feel like I've been brainwashed. Yeah. So that's one of the uh, arguments that I have with them all the time. Yeah. You know, always just focus on the specific details and. And, and know the, the basis of the Catholic teaching for that particular thing. That's 
that's, um, you know, well, that's how. And Ron, isn't it, is it true also that um, by going to confession, uh, you also are able to receive the grace, the sanctifying grace that you need that you wouldn't be getting yes. otherwise. That's certainly true. And not people who are the other Christians, I don't think they understand the importance of san sanctifying grace. I think, you know, what I, my comment I was going to make earlier was that I think it's really interesting the, um, how the Christians who go to these churches, you know, four square churches, all these churches where they go and they'll often have the explanation, even, you know, ex-Catholics saying they go to these services and they're so enlightened and you know, all the singing and, and everybody loves each other and, it, and they leave there so enlightened. And it's like, well, sure. I mean, you hear this, this um, person said, you know, building up the, you know, the Christian belief and you have the singing and, you know, it is fulfilling. I've gone to some of those services and so I know what they mean. But I, the, the sad thing is, is they don't understand the, the, full history of uh, Christ's teachings and and they don't understand the Catholic religion and it's too difficult for them to want to learn or think they need to so they miss out on that and you know unless you understand what's going on in a Catholic mass you don't get excited about it and we going to raise in a Catholic school and we go to church every week, our class, you know, kids aren't really taught in Catholic school uh, when they're little, what's going on enough. Yeah. Or so right. they, and they grow up and they still just kind of, I wrote just, you know, from um, repetition, they, they go to church, but unless you really understand what's going on in the mass, it's hard to get excited. But, you know, I learned once I did understand the mass, boy, I am so much more enlightened and fulfilled mm -hmm. after right. going to mass than I could ever be at one of these places that's so, so artificial in the sense that a lot of these Christians, they feel uh, they I think they avoid the Catholic religion because it demands too much of them. They, it, they don't like authority. They don't like to think they, there's, you know, um, a God there that does not want them to live the way they want. And so it's an escape. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Ron, it goes back to what you said, some of, the, some of this that you said the first week about people who memorize the Bible, but they don't really know what it means. And that's what a lot of churches are like. They don't, non-scholars are teaching non-scholars, like a lot of Bible study groups, because I participated in one from an evangelical church with someone and I couldn't finish it because I was shocked. <laughs> yeah. they, you know, they, were, they weren't scholars. So, you know, I mean, I, they didn't have the background they interpreted it's, from opinion. Yeah, it's not even being, I mean, it's, yeah, they're, they're very, badly trained um it, it's it's not even you don't need to be a scholar you know but they have minimal training minimal qualifications and you know, sort of minimal understanding typically and and also the the way of understanding the bible is is typically especially among evangelicals fundamentally flawed we're going to have a, a section on you know, evangelical, every word is literally true and, and whatever. And that's the interesting thing. Well, actually, we should move on to move back to atheism. But, but yeah. so we'll discuss that, you know, in evangelical interpretation uh, later. So are there any other comments, questions? 
Okay, well, one of the things I do have, it's a broad question that encompasses all of this. When people challenge me about Catholicism, um, I don't necessarily want to engage with them because I don't have a background enough to give an accurate argument. And it seems like sometimes retreat is better than giving a false yeah. argument. Right, is actually, that, that, that leads into the next thing I was going to say, sort of things to do, how to go about um, engaging in a discussion with an atheist or an agnostic. So the first thing to do is to determine whether the conversation is worth having at all. <laughs> and, and if it is, whether you're the person to have it. So for example, for myself, you know, uh, a discussion with a humanistic atheist is very easy. That, that tends to be, you know, sort of very simple and I feel able to connect and, you know, have a good discussion. Uh, so remember, you're not necessarily trying to change an opinion or get draw someone into Catholicism. You're trying to change a perception and plant a seed. The Holy Spirit will do the rest of the work. So it's not about you not about your brilliance. It's about connecting with somebody, you know, in a human way, hopefully. So, so I can do that with, with a humanistic atheists. I, I, I can do that with Muslims. I can do that with Hindus. I can do that with Buddhists. Uh, I have never tried to do it with an egotist, egocentric atheist and can't imagine how to go about doing it unless the you know discussion is about some kind of practical aspect of, of religion but at a more philosophical level i simply you know there, there's simply no no uh, basis for a connection so it's not a good you know it's not a good uh, i'm not the person to do it for evangelical christians uh, I yes, I frequently have discussions, but they're generally not very cordial ones. Or <laughs> I wouldn't say they're not very cordial ones, but I tend to do most of the talking and uh, very little of the listening. Uh, some of which is is caused by the fact. I mean, for evangelicals. Uh, there's also a, a, this notion that Catholics are fundamentally stupid and Catholics, <laughs> Catholics don't know the Bible. They don't uh -huh. really know anything about you know, theology. Don't. So, you know, they just go and watch this ritualistic mass and feel whatever they feel. Uh, they have to boredom. And and that's the essence of Catholicism. So when you know, I kind of respond, like somebody asked me about you know, the church's teaching, what do you think about the end times? So I told him and he was completely quiet. I think he was shocked that he was going to tell me about the rapture, I'm oh, sure. <laughs> and of course, there, the, the rapture is a complete fiction. It's a, an invention in the last century and a half. I have a question, Ron. Uh-huh. Somebody told me, are you ready for the three days of darkness? I said, what is that? Well, you have to have um, some type of candle that doesn't, uh, you know, that is always have a fire on it. I don't uh -huh. know what that means. Three days of darkness. I mean, the, 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 there's all of this symbolism in, in, in the Old Testament about the sky being darkened in association with the day of the Lord, especially in, in Daniel and also in Isaiah. But it's a, it's a symbol. It's not, you know, to be understood literally. Yeah. Um, but people tend to take it, people tend to take it literally. People tend to. Yeah, this is Catholic people that saying this. Yeah, you know, the, 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 yeah. The people tend to look for signs of Christ's coming, 
Yeah. But, but there are no signs. No. That's an important just part of the point. Um, so, so it, it's ultimately, it's, I mean, the, the only thing you know you can say is really it's silly. I mean, <laughs> one of the one of the things that you know is, I mean, within on the one hand there's the teachings of the church, and on the other hand there's you know sort of practical belief. And you know, individual Catholics also often go over the, the over the top in individual areas. You know, so for example, it's very clear from the church's teaching that Mary is not to be worshipped as God, yet Catholics do it. It's idolatrous, it's a major sin, and yet many Catholics do it. Um, you know, we're not to engage in, uh, you know, astrology or things of that sort. Yeah, you know, my sister would go to mass and after mass go to the fortune teller. Oh, gosh. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's idolatrous and satanic. Yeah, people you don't, that say the rosary aren't, aren't worshiping Mary. It, it depends. It depends on inner motivation. We're asking her for her intercession. intercession. I'm getting yeah. a I mean, that, that's, that's true of the church's teaching, but the yeah. question is for individual believers. For example, sometime this month, there's, there's a, a rosary sponsored by a group called uh, America Needs Fatima. Mm -hmm. You're praying the rosary so Mary keeps her promises. Mary makes no promises other than as an intercessor. So this is an idolatrous rosary. Oh. It's also, it's a rosary sponsored by a group that was declared heretical by the Brazilian uh, Council of Bishops. So, uh, so this is, you know, the American offshoot of that group. And finally, what you're praying for really is racism and for a return to a moral past. So it's a- uh, Oh, she asked us, she asked us through her, her you know, through the vision of these children to pray- No, 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 no. Yes, I understand about Fatima. Yeah. What, what I'm talking about is the email, you know, inviting people to join the rosary. Hmm whether what is the relationship of that to Fatima and you know from my perspective Mary is being worshipped as God so that's an act of idolatry Mary does not make promises or keep promises other than the promise to intercede and, and then you know the whole she thing does about, us, though. she does lead us she says yeah, you know, yeah but you know, yeah, but I'm talking about this specific rosary and the justification for it. I'm not talking about the rosary. I'm not talking about Fatima. I'm not, you know, talking in general. I'm talking specifically. Okay. So the point is that you always have to be careful, you know, about, you know, there are, uh, it's easy to go astray is, is basically all I'm saying. One time, I want to know if this sounds wrong. At one time, uh, when I was getting instructions, somebody explained to me that Mary was sort of like in a family where you know you've got your mother and your father, and sometimes it's easier to talk to maybe your mother about things, and that helps you when you finally go to your father and talk to him. You've you know sort of talked through the equivalent of Mary, and then you go and talk to your father, and that's how it got explained to me. And I thought, well, that makes sense because I'm not going, I'm not worshiping Mary. I'm just talking with her about religion and it helps me to think things through is that wrong no well that's not wrong but but the important thing about mary is that that she is an intercessor so yes so it's sort of less than talk about things so that you can take them to the father is that you have uh you you pray that so that mary will will directly convey your desires to 
uh, her son and to God the Father and to the Holy Spirit. So Mary is an intercessor, very much like you would, you know, ask, you know, somebody say has coronavirus and they ask all of their friends to pray for them. That's the same sort of thing, only Mary is uh, the God bearer. Mary is the mother of our Lord. And so she has a particularly close relationship to, to, uh, to the Blessed Trinity. I have a question. Mm -hmm. But um, in my conception of the, the, you said that the, about the praying Mary, has to be something about the, mm, the culture, I would say, my country, because uh, the Guadalupe is something that is um, really important, I would say, right. for our country and for our Catholicism. But I know that is not correct the way that uh, sometimes the people do the sacrifices and things. But I think it's something that um, we need to to hear from the from the people in charge, you know, in the, um, in Mexico, or because sometimes that that that's why all the religion criticizes us because we right. have um, um, too much. Uh, I would say, well, not faith, but um, we pray to Mary or uh, to Guadalupe in um, different way that's supposed to be. Uh -huh. So I don't know, that is something that um, the, <laughs> the religion needs to put clear or is because there's the misconception even in that in the, the countries or in the people and they don't specify that because they don't want to lose uh, some Catholics or is that something to do with that or? Well, the, the, you know, the um, I think it's not so much wanting to lose as that, you know, in, in many ways, the, uh, the church is still in the process of undergoing a transition from, you know, pre-Vatican II to Vatican II. And, you know, so in the pre-Vatican II church, the, uh, activity of religion, or right? the activity of Catholicism really centered on the priest. And, you know, we were really observers. So we observed the priest and uh, that was really all we were called on to do. So most Catholics knew very little about the faith. Uh, the Baltimore Catechism in the United States was you know, the, the major means of teaching and it, the principles of the faith. And it was sort of lethally boring and not very good. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, you weren't really called on, you know, Catholicism was at its root, fundamentally ritualistic. And, and so Vatican II really in many respects changed that and also calls on us really to be an activist church. So each of us is responsible for ourselves as a disciple of Christ. We're responsible to each other as disciples of Christ. And together we are all you know, participating members in the body of Christ. So our role is to be active we're no longer to be passive. It's no longer about the priest. The priest is now you know, the spiritual leader of, of, uh, of, uh, of parishioners. And so hopefully, you know, he guides them forward, helps develop their faith so that they can serve the kingdom of God. So that the focus is instead of observing on acting, uh, so, but that's a huge transition and, and, you know, it's still incomplete and still imperfect. It's still true that, uh, you know, on the one hand, enormous advances have been made. On the other hand, 
you know, it's still in its early stages and we're still far from being an activist church. We now have a church that has more activist members, but it's still limited and it still needs to, and, and it's still true that, well, the most Catholics don't know the faith. Uh, you know, and, and that becomes a real problem because there are, you know, inherently in, in, in Catholicism and in all of the pre-Reformation religions, there are, you know, sort of real traps. Ritualism, you know, is one of them that you think that the ritual itself imparts something, but it doesn't. You know, if you, you can go to communion hourly each day of your life and it can be a completely meaningless activity if you don't, in a very you know, real way, recognize that Christ is physically present, that that's just, that's not a ritual at all. You know, uh, Mary, uh, worshiping Mary as God is a real trap. There are any number of uh, con going to confession without really repenting and believing your sins are forgiven is a trap. There, there are you know, very many of them in, in Catholicism. There are actually very many of them, in fact, in all religions, but there are simply other traps for, uh, you know, others of our, particularly our separated brethren. So d does that help to answer the question, Rosario? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so back to the things to do. The, the second thing, if you, if you decide you're the person to engage in the uh, conversation is to listen. You know, this should be a dialogue rather than a monologue. And, and particularly for an atheist or ag what, agnostic, what an atheist or agnostic has to say, it's important to listen because in some sense, they are the, the you can see in yourself the mirror in them, the mirror in which you as a Christian or in which Christianity is reflected. And often that vision is not a good one. So it's important to listen, you know, particularly to criticism, to, to uh, see major areas of, of objection and major areas in which improvement is needed, particularly for us personally. So are there ways in which we're being hypocritical, for example? Um, if you're going to engage in a discussion with an atheist or, or an agnostic, never argue that the existence of God can only be discerned through the eyes of faith. That obviously shuts down the conversation you appear both arrogant and stupid. So always respond honesty, honestly to criticisms. There's no need you know, to defend the indefensible. You know, so I'm a Croatian Catholic. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about the Ustasha, but Ustasha was a Catholic fascist movement that uh, was in power in Croatia during the Second World War. And they exterminated a quarter million Serbs, 50,000 Jews, um, and any number of gypsies. You don't have to defend that. I would never defend that. That was a mortal, a mortal sin. I mean, that's to put it mildly. You know, so never defend the indefensible. So also approach the dialogue as a learning experience for yourself, especially for, you know, with, with, with atheists there, even if the, 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 the question is the existence of God, we believe in God, but we also want to learn what we as disciples can do better of the ways in which we can be better disciples 
and of the ways in which uh, religious behavior is off-putting, especially for many atheists who have been hurt profoundly by Christianity and have turned away from God as a result. And also try to find common ground, if it's at all possible, with, for, for humanistic atheists, you should be able to connect on the church's social agenda or on the church's social teaching. And then finally, you know, there's a Greek word, adiaphora, which is very important and always good to keep in mind. A-D-I-A-P-H-O-R-A. -A -A. Adiaphora is an inconsequential difference. It's something that's unimportant. So, for example, and we'll, we'll, the first question is about um, you know, the Bible, the 6,000 years of the Earth's existence and whatever. But uh, a, de a debate about uh, creationism is not a good thing to have with an atheist. It's really adiaphora because it fundamentally isn't a tenet of faith. Catholics can, you know, believe whatever they want. And so there's no point in arguing. And for myself, that's the most common question I'm asked. And I always disassociate myself from creationism since you know I myself am a Darwinian. Creationism has you know, no place and that's not what the Bible, it's not what Genesis from my perspective is about. So those are the basic you know, sort of ground rules for things to think about and do uh, when uh, having a discussion about the faith with an atheist or an agnostic. Are there any questions? Yes, one more, please. Mm, uh -huh. So you say that it's no good to engage with, um, for, for example, if they are Catholics and they, they are just uh, criticizing um, all the bad things and all the, the way that you try to um, have the religion or, you know, so it's better no engage because that is the part that really <laughs> bothers me, I would say. With, with Catholics? And yeah, the same with Catholics. For, I would say for me, I have uh, friends that are uh, from a different religion and we don't agree, but we just have, uh, I would say conversations about faith and we agree on a lot of things. But my... <laughs> My problem, I would say, or the thing that I engage more is with um, same um, Catholics that they have the religion in the way that they want, and they are no, uh, they don't have a, a real uh, compromise with the um, with the church, I would say, uh -huh. or even with the same um, Catholics that they go to church only when they have to do the sacraments and. Uh, they criticize uh, all the bad things in Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church. So that is better not engage with that, or that is something that we need to defend. Because that is my point, that is when they are Catholics, but they have the religion in the way that they want, and that's what I, what I get engaged, I would say, to, to say what I think. Yeah, I mean... I was speaking, you know, particularly about, you know, whether it's worthwhile to engage about atheists or, or agnostics. If, with other Catholics, my basic inc inclination, you know, is that you definitely should engage. Uh, and, and particularly, you know, when people are complaining, you know, the major, when, when people are complaining about Catholicism, the... Uh, or the behavior of the priest or, you know, whatever, or the congregation, the major issue is, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, it's like, uh, we're not victims or we shouldn't be victims. We can, you know, do something. 
if you think the mass is boring, then take a class on the mass. If you think the mass is boring, teach a class on the mass. If you think the mass is boring, find out what the mass is about. Do something. If you think something is not done very well, take responsibility for it. You know, complaints are a very passive form of existence. And, you know, we're in the confidior, there's that annoying little phrase for what I have failed to do. Mm -hmm. That, you know, is a biggie. Yeah. When you fail to do something, you're responsible for the sins that result from it. And those sins can be very, very, very serious. So passivity is, uh, you know, if you're active in sin, you're at least doing something. And there's, you know, some sort of motivation that God can understand that God can look at and extend mercy to. But if you do nothing, what is there? You know, God created us as living beings and here we are being doormats. <laughs> There's no motivation at all except for sloth and sloth itself is a sin. <laughs> so it's kind of a double whammy. One of the things that, that I got out of the readings this time too, um, I mean, that I understood before was when I was, when I was teaching science and I had to show the movies on the Big Bang Theory as uh -huh. a um, way of creation. Uh -huh. And um, a couple of the kids that knew me from St. John's came up and said to me, Mrs. West, is this all true? And I said, um, we have to go back and look and see what ex something had to exist first, didn't it? And it was, it was, we got into the kids and I got into a discussion with it and mm -hmm. they, you know, and, and it didn't conflict, you know, it just doesn't conflict. The, the big bang, <clears throat> the big bang theory was formulated by a Jesuit priest. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's what they said. So, uh, wow. so it's, its origin is Catholic. Right. Uh, it's it's uh, it is the, the predominant explanation now for how the universe was formed. Was formed. Yeah. And um, and it's not incompatible with Catholic right. teaching. Right. Uh, Catholic teaching does not believe in a new Earth in a you know six thousand year old Earth, although. It makes no dogmatic assertion about that. I just found it um, interesting when, at first, I was a little bit leery of pre of presenting it and having them maybe get somebody else to do it. And then when I look, when I really saw it and everything, I said, "Oh no, this is not a problem. This is, you know, it's not a problem at all." So, yeah, yeah actually, you know, th th in some ways, I think that goes back to brainwashing. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a profoundly uh, Protestant culture, and much of our presuppositions, even though we're Catholics, about um, you know the Bible, about Christianity, come to us from Protestantism, and increasingly over the last half century have come. I mean, at this point in America. Protestant culture is pre predominantly white evangelical fundamentalist culture. Mm -hmm. and, and so its presuppositions are sort of deeply ingrained in Christianity. And one of those is that Adam and Eve were two literal people. They were the first man and the first woman created by God. There was a garden of Eden. The earth is 6,000 years old. And so when you begin to uh, teach something that conflicts with that, you begin to feel like you're committing heresy. And, and it's kind of reinforced by the fact, I mean, you know, so for example, when, when I teach about Genesis, I always use, I always speak as if Adam and Eve were real. Mm -hmm. 
because they're simply representations for humankind. And th there's very real meaning you know, in, in, in doing that. If you look at you know, the fathers, it's unclear whether they literally believed in Genesis, the Genesis creation story or not. St. Augustine, for example, clearly didn't, but most commonly they use it as a symbol. So for example, Gregory of Nyssa argues about the, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, the Genesis said that the tree of whatever one is at the center of the garden, or they're both at the center of the garden, right? So he concludes that there's actually only one tree. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are the same tree. The question is, how is the fruit consumed and with what motivation? And so there's an important spiritual message there that St. Gregory is developing that appears to be based on the literal interpretation of Genesis, but actually only uses it as a representation. And so the point of the whole thing is that we're frequently sort of intimidated by <coughs> our own misconceptions about the church's teaching and, and about the, the sort of predominant view imposed on us by uh, Protestant Christianity. I mean, this is a profoundly Protestant culture. We, we um, and, and at this point in American history, a profoundly evangelical fundamentalist culture. And we often, uh, we often don't real, I mean, we, we typically don't realize it at all, especially given that evangelicals are always complaining that they're you know, on the verge of persecution and whatever else. I think there's an advantage about thinking about um, our, our personal faith uh, living in the most unchurched state in the nation because you have to look at, well, do I really actually know what this is about? And that's one of the reasons I'm in this class. Whereas if you live like I did for a while in Texas, you lived where everybody was just like you, um, at least that they had a Christian faith and then there were a lot of Catholic communities and everything, you don't really always tend to think in depth because you're not challenged. And when you're challenged, hopefully then you start to learn more and think in depth. Mm -hmm. Right. That's when I, I was brought up in Boston because every square mile had a church and every <laughs> other um, parish had a, had a Catholic school in the whole, in, within the whole city of Boston. And that's, that's where I grew up for my first 16 years of education. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. right. It's, yeah, it's definitely yeah, a very Catholic city. <laughs> yes. Not so much today. No, Baltimore was a very Catholic city. My daughter just moved back from there. Most of their ch churches in the city are closed. And if they, if the Catholic church sells them, it's some evangelical church that right. establishes itself. Yeah. Well, in Boston, when they've sold them, they've made them co-ops, apartments. Some are that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was hoping that we would have a breakout session to uh, to discuss, you know, um, the the first question about creationism and uh, responding to it, but we're very close to out of time. So, yes. um, so we'll have to do that at the beginning of next week's session. So it'll, yes. so it'll drag on. Huh. Uh, we may spend uh, the next, we'll spend the next session and possibly even the following session on, on the uh, the questions I sent out. I would guess that probably next week we'll only get through the first question on, <laughs> on uh, how can we believe in a 6,000 year old earth and not believe in science. Um, one of the, uh, if anyone wants to read it, I'll also send out a link to, 
I think I've saved it. There's a, a fairly good article. One of the the, the sort of uh, I guess canonical objection to Catholicism and science is Galileo and the Church's treatment of Galileo. And uh, so that, that's actually a, a really interesting issue and a very complex one. Uh, on the one hand, you know, the condemnation of Galileo was wrong uh, because it was really done not so much for his, his scientific research as it was for his arrogance, which um, inflamed everybody. And uh, um, so it's a really good thing to sort of study. And also uh, it, it's, it's sort of important because uh, in the people who criticize the church's response to Galileo often are ignorant of the history of science and the way in which scientific paradigms change. You know, so they sort of assume Copernicus comes along and voila, the view of the universe changes. But it takes centuries. And in fact, the church was at the forefront of, uh, of, uh, of the change. Copernicus was supported by the church. He was a canon lawyer. So I'll send out the link to that. And, and uh, so that's one of the things, you know, that, that should always, that is always going to come up in a discussion with, with, uh, with an atheist about the church's denial of science that, uh, you know, we persecuted Galileo. I'm hoping the answer is yes, because I'm looking forward to next week because I do, I mean, I did the readings and I've written lots of questions and things. So are we going to cover all the bullet points that we didn't get to this week in, in addition to the um, first one, one that which is about the 6,000 years that the, the Earth? We, Earth we'll age. try. The, the, there's a lot of material to unpack in the, the 6,000 years and the denial of science. So that may take the whole session. But we'll, we we'll go through, we, we will get through the questions. Okay. Uh, if, not, if not next week, the following week. Okay, so, that's good because I think they're really good questions and I really would like to hear more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we will. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I really don't like giving short shrift to anything I mean we're here we're here to learn and it's really I don't think acceptable to you know sort of check the box and say you know no I've covered discussions with apologetics with atheists and agnostics and we'll move on so my my hope is you know that we learn I'm I'm trying to learn from this I know you are, are trying to learn from this and we owe it to ourselves to you know take the time necessary to learn. Thank you. Having um, been a Catholic school teacher, I had catechist training and it was a, there are three different years of you had a little this, a little that. And I would go to these classes. I started, um, you know, being sponsored by St. John Vianney as a catechist at our parish and then became a Catholic school teacher. And I would go eager to learn and I'd be sitting in a room with people who had um, you know, okay, Our, you know, they raise their hand in the middle of, you know, these wonderful um, lectures and say, um, are you going to answer, the, are you going to answer the question number one? Are you going to answer this or this? And it was real frustrating because then it became just a, okay, you know, you had to get the right answer to write your paper that somebody then had to go through. So, yeah, you know, if it takes a while, it takes a while. If we can't all be here every week. We can still see what you've discussed so we can keep up with this. But this is real learning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is authentic.
So we'll be here for three years, Carolyn. Okay. Well, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that really helped me a lot was you said we're, we're still in transition from pre-Vatican II. Well, I didn't become a Catholic till after Vatican II. So when I talked to people who went all the way through Catholic school and you know, they're all pre-Vatican II. A lot of times I'm going, first of all, I, it doesn't dawn on me at first, but then, you know, it's like we came from two different churches. Yeah. So, it's true. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah, very different church. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and it depended much more Vatican pre-Vatican II churches were often, at least in my hometown, were very ethnic. And so there oh. was an Irish... Irish yeah. Italian church, uh, which was really nice. We wanted to, my mother and I uh, would have liked to have gone to the Irish Italian church, but we weren't Irish or Italian. So, <laughs> so we went to the, we went to the Croatian, Slovenian, Slovak church. And oh, wow. uh, the, uh, the priest was a Croat and, and he was really, um, very um, brutal, very hard. And he preached fire and brimstone. Uh, you know, if you had removed, if you had put on, you know, a, a, a blindfold and gone into church and cut out the Latin parts of mass and just focused on his homily, you, you know, would have sworn that you were in like a, a Southern Baptist church because... <laughs> It was all about how you're going to help. You know, he would even cry about it, and scream and point, and it was just really grim stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. any other questions, thoughts, comments? Oh. Okay, so I'll turn off the recording. <laughs>